Okay. We'll continue. Okay, so we start and uh, today we have great pleasure and honor to have uh, uh, Serge Gala with us. He's really working in this field for years and he was the first guy I met in my life uh, who was doing uh, sociophysics <clears throat> and he even coined this uh, name sociophysics. Uh, and he's really brave and he predicts something time to time. So today also we'll have a uh, talk about predictions. So it's, it's, really, it's really great to see you, uh, Serge, and the screen is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I am always very happy uh, to be with your group and uh, with you. And I remember my coming, uh, giving talk uh, many, many years ago in this winter school. Uh, which was at the beginning a very rare spot where you could talk about sociophysics, not like today. I mean, we forgot that, you know, 30 years ago, it was like a forbidden uh, topic. And uh, <laughs> Okay, so in September, as, uh, for the title 12, I gave a talk predicting Trump victory. And uh, from yesterday, we know that this was wrong, as uh, Biden was finally elected by the Electoral College in, in the state. So then it's uh, interesting to go about what went wrong. And uh, I, I, uh, I took the, the, the chance and the risk by making this prediction, because I think it's a very important element that we have to develop to, to, to more validate sociophysics approach uh, like we do in science. And of course, as all the issues at stake are so hot and political also, it's not like making a prediction for an experiment in a lab if it's wrong or, or good, you know, no, not everyone will uh, uh, draw strong conclusion about it. But I think it's very important, even if it's somehow risky, but we have to, to face it. So let's see. Uh, I don't, uh, so the conclusion, surprisingly, will be that indeed not much went so wrong. And actually, <clears throat> I am not so unhappy about my prediction and the outcome. And I will try to show you uh, why and how. And uh, before then, I will go along how I came to this prediction and then to see what was different besides the fact that Biden was defeated, uh, Trump was defeated but how I arrived there and what I could have changed to make it uh, right. This is what is interesting. So first, it's important to remember that four years ago, everyone was predicting that Trump was going to lose the election for sure. He was even predicted that he will lose a Republican nomination before the, the presidential uh, run. And indeed, using the model, which I again use this time, I was able to develop to, to predict uh, his victory and several months ahead of time. Uh, so, so this was kind of uh, very interesting because he went against all prediction and poll and analysis. More precisely, I did not predict his victory. I predicted the winning strategy for, for him. And uh, indeed he followed this. Of course, he does not know my paper, but it happened, that means that it go along. And I myself at, at this time did not believe that my prediction com, could uh, come through. And this is also an important element for our sociophysics uh, research that what we want is to be able to have tools which can give us some uh, outcome and forecast which are not in tune with our intuition or our sense. We, we want to be able to, to, to have a more objective approach to this, to this event. So then he win, and the, the, the prediction was right, not like this one. So remember that about this coming election during months, again, like it was four years ago, all media analysts poll were saying that Trump will be defeated this time. And even the blue wave was anticipating, that means say that he was really, he, he will be really strongly defeated uh, uh, after four years in, uh, in, uh, in power. And for me, the overall media coverage had a taste of deja vu from the, the four years ago campaign, which then ended up with uh, Trump uh, victory. 
we have to remember that Trump has been forecasted during this four year by many that he will not complete his mandate. That means this was at the beginning, people were sure, he, but he did go to the end. And also this is an amazing uh, situation that they kept many, and in particular Democrats, were refusing mm -hmm. Trump victory, saying it was uh, manipulated or, or stolen. Like today, Trump refusal. Oh, yes. uh, what's going on? I think that Tomek is not muted. Ah, okay. Um, so, so indeed, not much effort has been done to understand how Trump did win last election. And we were in a situation where he was running for a second mandate. So let's go now directly to the model I use and which I use again for this election. In this uh, uh, part of the model, I consider heterogeneous agent with floaters and inflexible. The floaters are agents which are having an opinion, which are advocating for it, but they are susceptible to shift opinion if given convincing arguments, stronger arguments. So they, they know what for who they want to vote, but they can shift this person. Inflexible, which can be called also stubborn, committed, these are agents which has made a choice and they will not depart from it, whatever can happen, whatever argument you can give them. So I, I consider in my model a combination of these two kind of agents and having two choices, A and B, which are competing among the agents before an election. So A can be Clinton or Biden, and B will be Trump. <clears throat> now, how this floater can change their mind, this is a very complicated cognitive process, of course. And we make it the physicist way, which we make it very simple. but yet trying to, to grasp some non-trivial element. So what I do here is I consider that the whole complication of argument and psychology, which are involved in discussion, trying to convince one another, can be mapped to a one person, one vote, and using a local majority rule within a group of people which is arguing about for who to vote. So it's very simple and it will produce a local group polarization with people when they are discussing. This will apply only to floater within the group, of course, and not to stubborn agent because they don't change their opinion. The problem by having made this very simple uh, uh, assumption of local majority rule is that indeed majority rule will have a problem. It cannot work for even size at a tie, there is no majority. And this is a very interesting element because here we are going to depart from a physicist attitude. A physicist, if we are dealing with atom, would say that at a tie, nothing happened, no update. However, here we are dealing with human. And then my, my hypothesis was to say that indeed at a tie, we have a collective confrontation of individual opposite view, and then this opposition get balance. So we have the spontaneous creation of a doubt within the group with all the given argument. People rationally have no reason why to choose A or B. And my main hypothesis is saying that in this peculiar case at a tie, Indeed, the doubt which seem to result from a balanced situation is indeed biased along the prejudice which are spontaneously and unconsciously activated among the agent which are discussing. And then we can have heterogeneity of prejudice. And then the hypothesis is say that at a tie, 2A, 2B for a group of size four, for instance, I will go to 4a with a probability k and 4b with a probability 1 minus k. k will depend on the distribution of prejudice and depending on which 
uh, choice are we talking about? It's important to say that for the people in the group, the choice which they end, it, they end up doing is by chance. But here, what, what I'm saying that this chance, it's not by chance, is according to the prejudice, but they are not aware of it. So how does the model work? We have a proportion, an initial proportion, P0 of agents supporting A, and a small A proportion of inflexible, which means among the P0 A, we have A inflexible and P0 minus A floater. And for the B, one minus P0 with small B inflexible and one minus P0 minus B floater. Then agents are randomly distributed in small group. <clears throat> we can have different sizes. They are updated locally, not inflexible. Then they are reshuffled and distributed again, and so on and so forth. So we can repeat a number of successive updates. And each local update modifies the respective proportion of A. We start from P0, then we'll go to P1, P2, P3. And we want to know if we can anticipate where this is going to lead. So in order to answer to this question and study the, the phenomena in detail now, we have to write it in equation. And then I will uh, take now, uh, because this can be solved really linear uh, uh, analytically, and it's a nice uh, outcome, a group of size four, in which I have this inflexible, tie-breaking K and uh, a floating proportion. This now is possible because before I could not have at this level the combination of all sides because we just published with Cheon, a colleague from Japan. <clears throat> now I was able to have an analytic formula for my model for any size and having all the ingredients of tie-breaking, inflexible, and also contrarian, which are not included in the present analysis. So let's see now what we get from group of size four with all these elements. First, to remind you, because this is an old result, if I had no inflexible, the tie-breaking has a very strong effect on what is expected of a democratic balance. It's no longer democratic because for the opinion, if k is equal to zero, which is against the prejudice, it needs to start above 77% in order to stay majority when people are discussing. Otherwise, it will go down, go on, and to lose the election. For the opinion, which is in tune with the prejudice, it is enough to start above 23% to finally win the election. You see why it's so important. It means if I start with a support for A of 24%, depending of K equal one or zero, you see that the outcome is totally different. So indeed, for the first election, Trump has been using this approach in order to win, however, in a non-trivial element, in non-trivial way, and he deployed his technique in two steps. He did that because the first spontaneous prejudice was acting against him, actually. So he was not in tune with the prejudice. So then he had this paradoxical approach, which was not obvious to understand within my model, that when he was making this shocking statement, then he was really infuriating millions of people, sincerely, even people which wanted to vote for him. And then they say, no, we will not vote for him. But they wanted to, to debate, to argue why you should not vote for Trump after such a sexist or racist statement. So then, in the first step, he was losing support. But at the same time, this emotional reaction was unfreezing deep block prejudice which were present among many agents. And then, in the second step, as he reordered the hierarchy of activated spontaneous, he will get more and more support. Let's see how this can work, because however, it did not work in every state. And because why? He need the new support when he fall by losing by after a shocking statement, he modifies the position of the tipping point but you need to go down still above the 
tipping point, even if this one now is very low. Let me show you two examples. Here, it will start with a support of 65%. And then as first the spontaneous prejudice was against him by people discussing with time, he will lose naturally support. And here we are, we went down to around 30 something. Then he make a shocking statement. And then he lose a lot of support at once without discussion, just by this emotional reaction. However, by doing it, he modified the k equal to zero to k equal one. And then now, because P3 is at 164, and the new tipping point is at 163, it's above. So, so then it will start increase when the people discuss in the second step due to the tie breaking effect. You see that by modifying the value of k, we went from a tipping point which was at almost 84% to 16%. Now, with the same configuration, but now if the drop would have been a, a little less at down to 16.2, which is below 16.3, then even if he was able to have the K equal one, he will finally end up losing the election in this I'm state. I'm sorry to interrupt you for a while. Yeah. But I, I'm afraid I didn't get the most important thing. What was the K? What was K? K, K? K is the proportion of prejudice which will be at the benefit of opinion A. Okay. Uh, you can see it here. You see, for instance, here K is equal to one, which means at a tie, two A, two B go for four A. Yes, okay. Here it go to four B. Yeah, 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 I understand, okay. yeah, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So now let's see the effect of, uh, of uh, inflexible. So I take away the tie breaking, and then in order to have no tie breaking effect, it's enough to take K equal half, which is nothing happened at a tie. 2A to B, stay 2A to B. So first, let's see a situation when I have only one-sided inflexible, which means inflexible or stubborn people only for opinion A. The equation is written here. We have to put in the other one, K is equal to half and B equal to zero. And then we got this one. Now, what is interesting is the following phenomena. This is no tie breaking, no inflexible, perfect democratic balance. The tipping point is at 50%. Here now I have put 8% of inflexible for A. This give a kind of significant uh, advantage for A because the tipping point for him bef before it was at 50%, now is a, it is at 44%, which means A to win need to have an initial support above 40%, 44% and not 50%. However, if its initial support is less than 44%, it will lose. For a higher percentage of inflexible on A side, 18%, now the advantage in the location of the tipping point is stronger, bigger. It is at 37. Now A need to start above 37 support to win. But he can still lose if he does not have his support. So it is a minority support, but not a very low minority to be above 37, already a substantial minority. Here we can see how it works for an initial support for A of 20%, in which I have zero inflexible, 0%, 5%, 10, 15, 20. You see that. Up to 15, it does not really modify the outcome of the election, but at 20, it will win. So, so this, we have an abrupt change in the outcome for 5% more inflexible, Why going from zero to 15 did not change anything. However, here there were a very interesting and surprising effect, which was unexpected, that actually above a threshold in the proportion of inflexible on the A side, something really surprising appears. That the dynamic is totally changed. 
because we have now one of the attractor and the tipping point, they get closer, closer, and they coalesce and disappear. And then we find ourselves with a new dynamics with no tipping point and only one single attractor. We can see how it works here. I start from the situation where I have here 8% inflexible for A, and then you see we still have, uh, even if it is non-symmetric, a tipping point dynamics where the tipping point is at 44. However, when I move from 8% to 16%, because the threshold, the critical value is 15, you see what I have now. No more tipping point, only one attractor at one, which means whatever is the initial condition for A, it will end up winning the election, no matter how low it is. So it's a very dramatic effect. And then there is really nothing to, you, you, you even don't need to know what is the initial support if you can know that it is a single attractor dynamics, and then for sure it will win. Now, of course, the real situation, you have inflexible or stubborn, stubborn people on both sides with different proportion, and then we have to solve the equation in this case. It's a little more complicated, but it's still solvable. And it happened that this effect of jumping from a tipping point in dynamics to a single attractor dynamics still occur, depending on which opinion, which have more inflexible on its side with two different critical value of this excess. So I, I, I'll define X as uh, the difference between A and B, as a, a small value, small A and small B. So this is the excess of inflexible for A, or the excess of inflexible for B in case X is negative. So I have now several regime. If I am in between the two critical value for excess in inflexible, I have a tipping point dynamics. If X is positive, the tipping point is below 50%, which means an advantage for A. If X is negative, the tipping point is above 50%, so now it is an advantage for B. When the excess in inflexible is above the two on each side, uh, the, the critical value, A win always or A lose always. Let's see uh, a first scenario. Here I have 14% inflexible for A, and as x is equal to 2, so I have an additional 2% for a, which means b is equal to 12%. So tipping point dynamics with a tipping point located at 47 at the advantage of a. Now, if I go from, I had here, you see, uh, 14 and 2. And now I go here to 20% and 2. So I have the differential is still 2% more inflexible for A. However, the inflexible for A has moved to 20% and then 18% for B. Now we have moved to one single dynamics attractor, and the attractor is located at 74, much above 50%. So A will win. We can have, of course, the, the symmetric reverse situation when x is smaller than the second uh, critical value, which means now b has the excess in, uh, in uh, inflexible. So still 20% of a, but now b has 21%. And then the single attractor is located at 32%, which means now a even if it starts above 50%, you will lose the election. So it's very interesting to, to see, you see how we have changed 2018 to 2021, and then the outcome is totally different. So then this model I applied to this uh, 2020 election. And then the first question is, 
are we going to have the same effect of tie breaking that we had for the first election with this frozen prejudice, which will be activated by Trump shocking statement? My answer was no. Why? Because after four years of Trump being president, everyone got used to his shocking statement. So actually, people now say, okay, one more thing, you know, you don't believe or it's crazy or whatsoever, but you don't get this emotional reaction because it does not make any difference what he can say. So this will not work any longer. And then does it mean that the conclusion was that prejudice will not have any role? And here I say no. Because what has been now uh, neutralized is its capacity to modify the hierarchy of uh, prejudices. However, now we still have the prejudice effect, but the spontaneous one, which are naturally activated. And actually, both candidates can play and did play on this prejudice. So now we are on the same ground. And I, I identify two major prejudices, which I think has been playing a role in this election. There were the fear prejudice, fear of a second mandate for Trump. So many people were really scared of what could happen with four more years of Trump president. And also, people were scared of what Biden being president uh, could uh, be uh, the effect on America. So they were, they, had, they, were, they were also scared on the other side of Biden being president. And we also have the, the prejudice of, with the COVID, uh, individuals stand facing a danger to be reckless, like has been Trump, no, no mass, you know, saying, I, I am not afraid, versus cautious, like Biden was always wearing a mask, taking precaution. So what is very important here is to say that both candidates are competing to benefit from this prejudice effect. So what is going to matter now is the difference on, of K with respect to the balance value of 50%. So I introduce DK equal K minus half. If DK is equal to zero, no prejudice effect. If DK is positive, so there is a little more effect for A. If it's negative, the advantage is for B. What can we say with respect to inflexible? After his four year in presidency, Trump has highly polarized the American voter and he has creating a, a, this new situation where millions of voters were and are blind Trump supporters and millions of voters are blind anti-Trump supporters. So indeed, this is going to be very important and I think it has been very important in this election and we can see which one has the advantage with this variable, which we already use, x, a minus b. If x is positive, more a inflexible. If x is negative, less n, less a, a inflexible. And as for the prejudice effect, the inflexible was is available on both sides, every candidate, as is stubborn people. And this will be a major key. This was my prediction. However, this time, what is novel with respect to the uh, earlier elections, the, the former one, is that indeed prejudice and inflexible, they can either add at the benefit of the same candidate or they can compete one another uh, for one candidate and against the same candidate. So, so the situation is going to be more open somehow because what it will matter is the combination of excess of stubborn agent and excess in the prejudice effect. So we can have three different situations in every state, either DK positive, X positive, DK positive, but X negative, DX negative and X positive. Let me show you now the effect of this element. Here, I first, I take a situation where I fix X, and decay, and I, I vary A. A is a proportion of inflexible supporting opinion A. X is a difference, so as X is, is negative, I took it here to 2%, which means each time 
For instance, here I have 20% inflexible for A, it means I have 18 for B. Here I have 25 for A, which means I have 23 for B. Here I have 30% for A, 28 for B, 40% for A, 38 for B. DK, the prejudice effect here is taking positive, always at the advantage of A, and with a very small value, 5% advantage. So what is really interesting here that in the first case where I have the overall proportion of stubbornness is not so high, that means it's 20% and 18%. We have this single attractor, it's 65, so A is going to win. When I increase the support for A, you see that now the single attractor driving the dynamics moved down to 53. So A is still winning, but now it's a, at a smaller value. If I go to 30%, now for A, I am just at 50%. So it's very, very uh, an angle action. And if I go to 40% for A, now A will lose. So, so it is interesting to, to say that, oh, I think I, I just say something wrong from the beginning. When it's negative here, it's 20, 22, 25, 27, 30, 32, 40, 42, of course. Here in all these four cases, B has 2% more inflexible than A, and A benefit 5% in the prejudice. And the fourth case is I increase the overall level of inflexible. So, so when I go to very high uh, level of inflexible, the 2% advantage for B is more important than the 5% advantage in prejudice for A. We, we are trying to see the competition between stubbornness, excess of stubbornness, and excess of prejudice. Now we have a series of uh, graphs where I fix the proportion of stubbornness for A, and I vary X and DK to see how they can neutralize one to another to get to a 50% attractor. Here I have 30, 36, and it will be 36 in the three graph, support of inflexible for A, here, only 1% more for B, so it's 37. And then A has 2% advantage for inflexible. When I double the excess of inflexible for B to 2%, I need to multiply by four the benefit of prejudice for A to keep the balance at 50%. If I multiply by three from this one, the excess of prejudice for B at 3%, I need to multiply almost by six the effect of prejudice for B. So, so you see that it's not linear. If prejudice and stubbornness get balanced, when I increase their value, I, I don't have to, uh, it's not enough to increase them in the same proportion. And here we have a kind of more uh, explicit view of this to show that high value of inflexible with little respective difference require much more larger difference in prejudice, which means the higher we go in the polarization effect, the much bigger prejudice effect we'll need in order to compensate it. Here I fix the, the, the proportion of stubbornness for A and B, giving an advantage of B of 6%. So I have 40% stubbornness for A, 46% for B in the three case. In order to get the balance, I need 32% advantage here for A to compensate the 6% advantage of B. Now, when I have the 6% here, in order to keep uh, so let me see, what did I change here? Oh, when I, I go to 40%, it does not modify the single attractor. I need to go to 41% in order now to give the advantage to A. 
from this balance. So, so you see that the, the prejudice effect get weaker when the polarization, overall polarization is high. So then my point I arrive, this was before the election, what to conclude about this election. First, that at last election, Trump found a martingale to win, which could not be applied by, by Clinton. But this time, the winning strategy is the same for each candidate. Of course, unfortunately, of course, it means it's not very glorious because you want to increase stubbornness on your side and to increase the fear of the other candidate. <clears throat> or also to show strengths or caution about the COVID. So, so then, indeed, in each state, the election outcome will be driven by these two quantities, X and DK. And from what we saw, some illustration, tiny excesses will make the outcome. So then the question was, what can be said about DK and X? About stubbornness, million of voters has been stubborn against or in favor of Trump. And, and also, I, I pay attention, say, make this remark that blind anti-Trump supporters were not, not automatically blind Biden supporters, in particular, in particular the, the uh, left people from uh, Thunder supporters. Some of them, I think, were reluctant to, to vote for Biden because the political gap is too far from them. And then I also was seeing, of course, I am in France only from the, the news and uh, you know what you can see on TV, that Trump has been much more involved in the ground to motivate his supporters, so to, to increase the stubbornness effect. So, so, but what important to say that a few percent difference in X will matter a lot for the outcome. With respect to, to prejudice, I also come to the conclusion that indeed, the fear of Trump has been eroded in past, in part because people know what is going to happen. So they, they don't want to have it, but, but they know what they, they would have, have in case he would succeed. However, the fear of Biden was more irrational because some people say, you know, it's going to be socially in chaos, I don't know what. So I, I, I was considering that when you are on irrational phantasm, this create more fear that when you know what you have to be scared of. This element, I really have no idea at all how uh, reckless versus cautious with the COVID uh, will be distributed among American uh, uh, people, agent, that mean, uh, even if it seems that Democrats were more cautious than Republican, but uh, I have no access to any estimate. So, so then I came to this, uh, slide, which I, I uh, show in this talk, uh, earlier talk, say that, of course, I have no access to neither the vari various proportion of respective inflexible in each state, nor the respective prejudice proportion. But my Roth estimate was that uh, Trump would have advantage, tiny advantage, but in sufficient swing state to win. So this is my, my point, which lead me to make this prediction. But again, clearly, as I say, this raw estimate was just about my perception from being in Paris and only using uh, uh, Zoom and, uh, and internet to try to get this feeling. Actually, I have a paper which is an archive where uh, I, I, uh, I developed this prediction. So it's interesting because now I got uh, the referee uh, a report, uh, they have three referees, and of course, everyone knows the result. Uh, but I think it will be important, I have to see, to, to publish the part of the paper, how I come to the conclusion, but I have to add what, why it was not successful and what should be changed. I also did emphasis, and uh, this is very important, also connected to what I mentioned at the beginning, that we should dare to make prediction and uh, saying that it's not about taking risk or becoming guru. We want to develop an art science approach to political events, so we need to make prediction to check. And that if the prediction is successful, it does not mean the model is proven, that's it. Uh, and if the prediction is wrong, it does not mean the model has to be thrown away. In both cases, we have to get more progress and 
more uh, uh, understanding of the modeling and the political situation we want to describe. So, as a matter of fact, Trump was defeated with Biden victory. So what went again wrong with my prediction? And as I say, not much indeed, because I can say that I was almost right and much more close than polls, which predicted you know, a clear victory for Biden. And my prediction was Trump will win at the edge. And indeed, it's Biden which did win on the edge. And now I am going to uh, motivate this statement because you can read and hear many people saying that Biden victory is really a very clear and strong victory, but I don't think that is the case. With respect to the Electoral College, which is what matters in the state, it's not a national vote, but it's an Electoral College vote, so, so it's a two-step vote by state. Biden has 360, Trump 232, for a total of 538. So in order to win, <coughs> you need more than 200, that means at least 270. <coughs> so here you say, okay, Biden won, and you could say this is like much far from uh, from the frontier of 270. So it's a nice big victory. But now I will show you why it's not. I have taken here and showing you the result in three swing states: <clears throat> Georgia, Wisconsin, and, and Arizona. The elector of these three states are 16, 10, and 11. Now, when we look at the various results in this state, you have the figure here. The difference in Georgia, Biden won with 12,000 additional votes on Trump. So it's 0.2%, very, very small. In Wisconsin, he won with an additional 20,000 votes, 0.7, still very low all are less than 1%. In Arizona, he won with 10,000 additional votes, 0.3%. So indeed, when you add the, the additional vote he has on the three state, you got a total of 43,000. And this you have to compare with, there have been 11 million of vote, of ballot, so altogether, it gives only 0.38%. That means it's even less than half, uh, uh, zero half percent, 0 0.5. And then you see that to shift the total result of the election, you need to have, in case half of the additional vote for Biden, instead of voting for Biden, they would have voted for Trump, and then Trump will win. You see that when you take half of this, half plus one vote, plus one vote. So, so it's 0.1% shift, 0.35%, 0.15, very, very low value. And then, in, indeed, if you had 21 voters shifting their opinion, which is less than 0.2%, then Biden and Trump with the 37 electoral vote here shifting, will be at equality. And that equality is the Senate which will design the, the president, and then, but with one voter per state, and then Trump there would have win because he has the majority. So you see that with this only shift of 21,000, Trump could have been the winner of this election. So, of course, if Trump would have been elected with this 21 shift of vote, it will be also very uh, fragile victory, as I am showing now that Biden victory has been very fragile. So, so this is why I say my rough estimate saying more for Trump, actually it was a little more for Biden, but the main, I think, interesting point of the, of the modeling and where I, I arrived with the modeling was about this balance uh, of competing this time on the same 
ground for prejudice and tie breaking, while the first election, Trump was playing alone with the prejudice. Clinton has no access to this element. So I will conclude with uh, this. Uh, I think a lot of you know this book because it starts to be uh, an old book, eight, eight years already, but it's always a perfect gift for Christmas, but above 20, 22 years old uh, children, I think. <laughs> uh, I don't know if we, have, we can make it at 20. And uh, from your uh, library, you should be able to down, download the e e book for free, I think. So to conclude, it's very important to discover the law which govern our collective behavior, because today it's really instrumental to avoid being trapped by, by our unconscious archaic biases. At least all my modeling is showing and uh, focusing and lighting this point. And I think we need, of course, to much more work, much more paper, much more prediction, but I think that the issue at stake are huge for our future and we can contribute uh, in, uh, in our future by understanding uh, this element and uh, a lot has to be done yet. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Serge. And I see that Professor Kwakowski uh, finally <laughs> succeeded to, uh, to come here. So I know that you had a question. Do you want to ask this question, Krzysztof, or I should start maybe? But you have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself. Krzysiek. <laughs> Still you are muted. Maybe I will, I will try to find you here somewhere. And uh, mm -hmm. where are you? Uh, Sorry, it will take a while. Okay, so I will try to find uh, Krzysztof, but before I do this, I, I have uh, one question. Because in, in this model, prejudices are so important mm -hmm. because you have the group which is discussing of size four. If the size of the group would be larger, of course, the scale would be less important. Yes, am I yes. right? Yeah. Yes, yes. So now my question is, how do you know, and I know that you know, but, but, but maybe others, they don't know. How do you know that the size of the group should be four? Ah, okay, no, of course, it is not four. What I know from observation, and every one of us can observe, that when we are talking here about informal discussion. So you don't have a president which organizes a discussion. It's people discussing just together, you know, spontaneous, spontaneously, I mean, in a self-organized way. Now, if you have been in, in dinner or, or even, you know, taking a coffee together and you, you are more than six, seven, eight people, you will all have seen that the group fragment at once in small subgroup, people discussing at two, three, four, very rarely at five. When you have five people already, sometimes it will go to two to three. So then in the modeling, if we want to have more uh, precise value, we have to include a distribution of size of two, three, four, let's say five. And if you go to, or we can, put some six if you want, because this will reduce the effect, as you mentioned, the larger the group is, the less cases you will have of, of tie, of course, but the, the stubbornness effect will still be working huh, in, for larger group, actually. So, so this is why in the last curve I was showing, you, you saw that the prejudice was almost, it was very difficult to, to compensate the stubbornness effect. So, so for very high group, stubbornness will be like the only leading decision. However, when we are, as I say, to small group, if you have less cases when you go to six, for instance, what will matter a lot is the pairs. And when you go to pair, the, effect, the tie breaking is very strong. So it will compensate any, any uh, larger group presence. So somehow, the size four account for not taking into account the very strong effect by pair and not taking it into account the 
uh, weaker uh, effect of six uh, or more. So altogether, it gives a nice, uh, a rather good uh, 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 outcome of what would be a more uh, a more realistic situation. But we can solve the equation by combination of whatever we want. Thanks now to this uh, paper which we just published, in which now I can add the the update uh, equation for any size, even 100. It's enough to, to plug in 100 for A as a, the size group, and then you have the equation. So, so, so this is a great accomplishment. I'm very happy to have, uh, be able to do this uh, with my Japanese colleague. Yeah, thank you very much. And I see that Krzysztof is already unmuted. Yeah, thank you. I apologize, be late. I had a lecture too. My question is like that. <clears throat> provided that advisors of Biden have read your paper before. Mm -hmm. And uh, they should draw some consequences, some, some strategy from that. My question is, what should be this strategy? And if do you think that they apply it? Mm -hmm. So uh, I will answer and let me say, say there is several answers. I think, unfortunately, they did not know my paper. Uh, however, they did apply what I was suggesting to them, because when you, you see uh, the Democrat strategy has been first to increase a lot the fear of Trump. Uh, you know, they're saying it will be the end of the United States with another mandate of Trump. He's destroying not only the America, uh people, but the whole world. So that means the, the fear has been very strong putting forward a lot. And also, they have increased stubbornness on this side by anti-Trump feeling, which has been very, very strong, very uh, uh, emotional. Um, you, 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 you could see a lot of uh, Democrat supporters. They were like almost go, giving no rational argument, just saying that, you know, they are facing the evil and you just have to get rid of it. So, so they did play exactly on this element. For Trump, he has been playing with this all the time. So this is why he, the benefit was lower, but he starts from a higher value. And uh, But then why I came to the conclusion that he should have more advantages is because he was going to meeting. And uh, this meeting that we saw on TV with hundreds of people not wearing masks altogether, but getting galvanized. This creates stubbornness. On the other side, when you were looking to Biden meeting, he, he was wearing a mask and there were only 50 people in, in the audience. So that means very quiet, you know, at the long distance. So you don't get galvanized with this way. So, so I think that the media has played also a very important role to compensate this element of uh, Biden weakness for, for creating this stubbornness, but the media has been doing it against Trump. So I think this has compensated his attitude. So maybe this is what has been playing in. But again, anyhow, as I show at the end, the, the, Indeed, what we got is a very, very young situation uh, with respect to the various states, I think. But uh, it has been very, very, uh, very light uh, victory for, for Biden. Uh, there is another element which my modeling here does not account, is indeed the, the voting by mail. Because uh, I think that <clears throat> once here I study the dynamic of opinion of the whole population. Now, when people start as already vote, they cannot change their mind any longer. So, so you have subgroup of the population that are taking out. So it is as if you have a sequential vote with respect to the dynamics, which is still going on. I am talking about the floater, but so, so the floater, which did send a mail with their vote, they, they could not change their mind, whatever you, you can do. So, so I think that this is uh, a, an interesting element to study, but of course, uh, no one. I, I think it's possible to include this in the model. I'm thinking about it, but uh, there were no study because this is the first time 
that uh, mailing vote has been so huge. Usually, it's very small proportion. So they did. They could not before change the outcome, but this time they did. So, so this is a very important element. Not about talking about if it's legal, not legal. If it, but, but just saying that we have the democratic view that we are all voting the same day. The fact that you can vote on during three or four weeks, and uh, I think this may have an impact on the dynamics of voting. I don't know which direction how, but it, it must have an impact. For instance, if you take about the, the COVID, the vaccine, uh, that mean which now is starting to be available, uh, Trump was saying, you know, that he, he will get the vaccine before the end of the year. And uh, during the campaign, uh, Biden was saying, no, this is not possible. It will be only maybe the spring of next year. But, but then when it started to, to be uh, feasible that uh, the vaccine would be available at the end of the year, many people had already voted. So I don't know what would be the impact on some floater again, because the stubborn, they will not change their mind. But here we are really talking, the whole, the whole victory was done on the floater arts were small proportion, but they did make the difference in the swing state in the Republican state and Democrat state, the stubbornness is so respectively big, big that the floater cannot change the view. So, so these are subtle elements here, which were unusual also about, about this. So, so I think that uh, to answer, uh, I should say to Biden, you know, that you did the right thing <laughs> in his campaign. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Uh, do, do we have any other questions? We are slowly or not so slowly approaching to the end of our time, but maybe you have some other questions. Yes, I have one about the modeling. So uh, in, in this model, we have this, uh, we divide our society into two groups, in this, into these floaters and uh, inflexibles. But from the model definition, it seems like we assign these behaviors at each time randomly. So it's not a <clears throat> property of a given agent. It's like, uh, it's like a chance for being <clears throat> either a floater or inflexible. And now I'm uh, wondering whether this applies to real situation. I mean, in, in reality, these inflexible uh, people are are more like traits. I, I'm not sure if it's if if this really applies to this real situation in which we have um, these two groups of people. Mm -hmm. No, it's a very good point. Uh, you are right that the inflexible, the stubborn people, they are in reality most of the time they are always the same. That means they are not. When I say twenty percent of stubborn and 80% of floater, you can look at it as a given agent is 20% of yeah. the time stubborn and 80% of the time floater, or 100% of the time stubborn and respectively uh, floater, but they don't mix. However, here, as I am doing, using probability and uh, looking, you know, the various configuration, it does not change the result. So, so in reality, you are right, but mathematically it does not change the result due to the fact that I am uh, taking average of configurations. We, we can check this, uh, Alex. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you are right. Yeah, That's, uh, so yeah, because we were doing uh, similar things there for some time. And yeah. And also I had the also similar, I mean, not similar question, much more, much more trivial, but still. <coughs> Usually you just uh, make this, not just, but you are making this uh, uh, analytical calculations. You don't simulate it on any graphs or anything like no. this because you are not doing simulations yourself. But do you know if anybody was doing some similar like stubborns together with uh, stubborns on two sides and also this uh, uh, asymmetrical K on graphs? 
Do you know this paper? No, so, no. No, 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 I don't okay. know. No. Okay, we have maybe we have many people, young people here right now, so maybe. Uh, we'll this, this, this would be very interesting to, mm -hmm. to do really a uh, mm -hmm. simulation and taking more refined distribution and, uh, and uh, we were discussing this in Lviv I remember like years yeah, yeah, ago yeah, yeah, but yeah. at that time I didn't have so many students now we have really many people here so yeah yeah because what I would like to see from this uh, once it's done because I always my feeling was that indeed I don't take into account here any uh, network structure however I say that in order to do it uh, I when I was talking about having a distribution of size with different proportion. So I think that this would be the outcome of the structure of the network. How many two or three, you know, connected sides you can have or four or five. And uh, it will be really nice to see if it, it works and if we can relate it or, 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 or no. And so, so this will be great if you can have this simulation. I, to, to my knowledge, it was not done. Okay, and, uh, and having inflexible and also these different in prejudice, clearly not. Okay, thank you. So, okay. so very quickly, uh, I am waiting for the. <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> 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 we will try also with this with this yeah, stubborn and 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 floaters also the same. I mean, the, the, what Arek asked is also. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's very. It's in, yeah, yeah, yes. Point. Yeah, yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I'm afraid that we uh, we <laughs> went to the end of our seminar. It's more than quarter past two. So thank you very much. Thank and you. We, you. Yeah, and I hope we will see you soon in reality. Yeah, I hope, yeah, so. I, I hope, I hope so also that <laughs> the world will be. If not, oh, we'll oh, organize yeah. another Zoom, but I hope, uh, yeah, if we will, of course, we'll, if we will simulate anything, we will make a meeting and we will discuss. Oh, very, very, on Zoom. very exciting. Yeah. yeah. yeah nice. Okay. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for thank coming. You. Maybe you have some, maybe you have some other fast you. question, or quick question, or not. We can, we can. No, and if you have questions later, you can send me an email. You can send an email if to you want, also, yeah. If you want paper of reprint, I will send it to you also. Yeah. So okay. Not. And to, uh, just to, to tell you the, about the book, the book is available indeed in our library, so you can download it. If you have some troubles, you can write me. And, uh, and it's really nice to read. I mean, you have many nice parts, even if you don't dig deep into the modeling itself it's just a very nice book so uh yeah so you, i also yes. advertise this book for the christmas okay <laughs> thank you very much and, and see you okay great to bye. see you bye bye bye, bye. and good luck bye bye